from the time that Jesus gets in Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday up to the place where he stirred up enough opposition where Judas is going to betray him. So today, we look and see how did he go from being celebrated, having a parade, one moment, and then four days later, he's going to be arrested. Five days later, he's going to be crucified. Well, we just looked today, we had our Palm Sunday procession, but when Jesus came into the city that day, it wasn't the first time that there was a, a celebration where palms were waved and people yelled Hosanna. 200 years before that, there had been the same kind of celebration, that the people of Israel were under domination by the Syrian Greeks, the Seleucids, and the nasty guy named King Antiochus. And he basically was trying to get rid of any sign of Jewish culture, completely wipe it out. And one of the things that he had done is he had ended up desecrating the temple. So what happened was the Maccabees ended up leading a revolt, and as they came down into the city to declare they had defeated the Syrians, there was this parade. And they went directly into the temple, where they cleansed the temple, they restored proper worship uh, for the people of Israel. So what does that have to do with Jesus having a similar parade? Palm branches being waved. Where does he end up going? Straight to the temple. But you're thinking, there's not a problem in the temple. They have proper worship in the temple now. They don't have all this idolatry and all this stuff that King Antiochus had done. What's the problem? Jesus still says, worship's not happening the way that it's supposed to happen. There's a problem here. And he goes to confront it, and basically he's saying God does not have access to his people the way that he wants access to his people. And he's going to get rid of whatever barriers there are whether they're idolatrous foreign governments, or whether they're priests and, that end up not giving access to people to experience the goodness of God. So as Jesus heads into the temple, he is, doesn't seem like he should be going and finding enemies, but he's creating some. He's going in there and saying, you're getting in the way of people having free access to God and God's love. And when you, you feel like you're the one in charge of a place, and someone comes in and starts taking over, do you tend to, to accept that? No. So from that point on, they're getting frustrated with him. They are offended that he's coming in and declaring that he has authority in the place that they feel they have authority. They're angry at him, and they would like to get rid of him. They'd like to kill him because of the way that he's doing things. But why can't they do it? He's too popular. So our reading continues. One day is back and hanging out and teaching. And those chief priests, those temple leaders, continue to feel threatened by him. They're saying, what gives you authority to come into our place and teach people? And he ends up, they're asking him, how do you have this authority? And he ends up giving them sort of a catch-22 question, <laughs> where he says, okay, I'll answer your question. I'll tell you by what authority I am doing this, but first you need to answer me a question. And my question is, the ministry of John, was it from heaven or was it from people? And they, they realize that there's no right answer, that whatever answer they give, they're going to be in trouble. So they basically drop it and they say, okay, I guess we're not going to find out what your answer is. But as soon as he says, I'm not going to tell you, he ends up turning to the people and he tells a parable. And basically in telling that parable, he's answering that question, by what authority? He's doing that. Then in the parable, he says there was a vineyard owner, referring to God, and he ended up giving management of his vineyard to some people who were supposed to manage it well and give him the fruit that was due to him. And basically, what he's, he's talking about the people who are in leadership of the church, of the temple. They're the ones who have been given leadership. They've been given management of God's kingdom. And every time God sent them someone to straighten them out, to restore them, the prophets throughout the Old Testament, they ended up mistreating them and not listening to them and doing things the way they wanted to keep doing things. They didn't honor the owner of the vineyard, God. So Jesus says, so what's that owner of the vineyard going to do? He's going to send his son. 
basically he, at that point he's saying, I am the son of the owner of the temple. I'm the one who's coming to claim from my father that fruit that you haven't been bearing. And that instead of helping people to experience God, you're getting in the way, you're not bearing fruit that glorifies my father. Basically what he's saying is, since I'm the owner's son, I own this temple, and I'm giving you my pink, a, a pink slip, that you're not managing it well. What's gonna happen is my father's gonna give over the activity of his kingdom to other people. It's not gonna come through this temple building anymore. The authority now is given to people who will honor my father. And by the end of that parable, they're even more angry because they know that he told that parable about them, that they were the bad managers. They were the ones that weren't honoring God. So once again, what is it they want to do? They want to kill him. What's preventing them? He's still too popular. They can't, they can't get a hold of him yet. So our reading continues. Uh, so they're upset he's turned over the tables he's questioned their authority he's saying I'm the one who has been given authority to restore this to what God's purposes are and now all these groups are feeling threatened so in this section there's three different groups that are all trying to find ways to get him to incriminate himself, to do something where he will get in trouble. So the first two, and in Luke it doesn't say that these are the two groups, but in the other Gospels, when it talks about asking about paying taxes, it says, it says these are the two groups that come together. That it is the Herodians, the ones who have given in to the leadership of Rome, and the Pharisees. The ones who say, we can only worship God, we can't honor some other king. It would seem that those two groups would not necessarily hang out and have a beer with each other. Those are groups that would not want to be together because they, they didn't like each other. But their fear of Jesus, their desire to get rid of Jesus, causes even these two groups of enemies to work together as they come up with, they come up with this situation that seems like they've got Jesus stuck that the Herodians want him to say, yes, pay taxes. The Pharisees want him to say, no, don't pay taxes. But either way, he's going to get in trouble with somebody. So he answers their question, and what does he say? Show me a coin. Whose likeness is on here? Okay, it's Caesar. Okay, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, give to God what's God's. And basically, these two groups, the Herodians and the Pharisees, have just been silenced in their effort to try to get him to, to incriminate himself. So there's another group. It seems like every major power group is, is threatened by Jesus in some way. So there's another group, the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the ones who basically, they tended to be wealthier, they tended to be a little bit more in with the establishment of Rome, because they just sort of wanted peace. They wanted to make sure their temple was safe, that nobody messed with the temple. They wanted, their whole focus of their religion was basically the temple and the rituals of the temple. And because of that, it was just what they could see was the visible things were their religion. But they didn't believe in anything supernatural. They didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in anything supernatural. It was just what was visible. So they think they've got this thing where they cause Jesus to look stupid as they ask this question about who's going to be married to whom in heaven. And basically, by the end of the conversation, Jesus has answered them. Really, they only believe the first five books of the Bible, the Law of Moses, were authoritative. So Jesus had to answer them based on the books of the Bible they thought were authoritative. So when he's trying to show them why there was a resurrection, he went back to their books, and he says, Remember Moses? Moses talked about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and not talking about a God of dead people. He's talking about the God of living people. And basically by the end of, this, of the conversation, he's told the, Pharise or the Sadducees, you guys are just missing out on so much of what God is doing. You're just stuck on the physical, tangible stuff. When there's a resurrection, there's all this supernatural stuff going on around you. You're missing out on so much of what God is up to. And really so much of what Jesus is doing as he goes into Jerusalem 
is showing all of these different groups that they're missing out on so much of what God wants to be doing. And by the end of the conversation, they're still upset, but they don't know what to do. And the, and the reading continues. Grace? That was the last section, so... Um, <clears throat> So they've realized that they're not going to entrap them. So some of the scribes actually are pretty impressed, and they're there to just sort of talk to him. And so does he just sort of back off at that point and stop pressing things? No, he, even as they're backing off, he's pressing things even harder. He's saying, okay, yes, there's all this Messiah talk. Now who is this Messiah? Is he just the son of David? Is he, is he just this... Um, human descendant of David? No. Um, David himself called him his Lord. David himself saw the Messiah as being much greater than David. So maybe you need to be thinking about who you're dealing with right now. He's pressing things a little bit harder. And, and he starts talking to people while the scribes are watching, saying, watch out for the scribes, because they're just in it for getting attention for themselves. They're they're missing out on all that God is really up to. And so he continues to tighten down the screws to get people a little bit more frustrated until finally they still want to get rid of, rid of him, but they still don't have access because he's still too popular. So if the enemies aren't going to get access to him in the way that they want to get access to him, how is it finally that they're going to get access to him to arrest him. If it's not through the enemies, it'll be through a friend. So it's going to be a friend who's, who doesn't understand all that Jesus is up to. A friend, Judas, is going to end up betraying him, taking the price of a slave, 30 pieces of silver, to sell him. Um, and so we're going to continue as we go through the week. Now do you understand a little bit more how he can go from being celebrated on Sunday to arrested on Thursday. He's basically stirred the whole city up, all the different power groups. They all want to get rid of him. And now the question is going to be, uh, and basically the last thing I want to say is, why is it that he confronted in the first place? Why did he go into Jerusalem? Because God wanted more than what the religious system of the day was inviting people into. God wanted them to experience his presence, his grace, his love, his forgiveness. And all these different groups had pieces of it, but none of them understood the fullness of what God wanted to do. So Jesus goes in as the son of the owner, and he says, let's start things over again. I'm going to introduce you to what God designed in the first place the kingdom of God. And if the way it's going to turn out is it's not going to be these power groups that are going to figure it out. It's going to be the tax collectors, the prostitutes. It's going to be the people who are willing to experience God in all of his fullness who will end up bearing fruit for the kingdom. Amen. Amen.